Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon-sponsored review time again, and we've got a weird but fun one today. It's always important to remember that while superheroes are the dominant force in American comics, that wasn't always the case. Back in the Gold and Silver Age, superheroes were building and growing more in popularity, but there were a ton of different kinds of stories out there. While the ones that most people would probably name are different genre stuff, like westerns or science fiction or romance, there was also the funny animals genre. If you're unfamiliar with the term, basically think Looney Tunes, anthropomorphic animals that take on more and more human characteristics and can talk, but despite the name, they're not necessarily always comedy. It's just like with superheroes dominating American comics, humorous tales featuring them tended to be the main force of them. Columbia Pictures in the 40s, through their company Screen Gems, produced a number of short stories featuring the characters of Fauntleroy Fox and Crawford Crow, aka the Fox and the Crow. The shorts were popular enough that DC held a license to produce comics based on the characters from the 40s through the 60s, at one point having three different books devoted to them, Real Screen Comics, Comic Cavalcade, and eventually their self-titled The Fox and the Crow. The reason I bring all this up is because near the end of their book's life in 1966, a backup feature was introduced that soon overtook the popularity of their own book and eventually was renamed it, Stanley and His Monster. The basic concept was that a little boy found a monster in the sewer and befriended it, the creature essentially becoming his dog and companion. Hijinks ensued, but from what I can tell, there wasn't really a solid explanation for where the monster came from. But hey, both Jerry Lewis and the Ghost of Napoleon guest starred in it at one point, because we've got to keep our priorities straight for storytelling. Weirdly, the book was cancelled only a few issues after the renaming. Guess it wasn't that popular, but it apparently was popular enough for Phil Folio, known nowadays for creating the book Girl Genius with his wife, to produce a four-issue miniseries in 1993 that delved into it more, while also being a comedic fantasy story in its own right. And that four-issue miniseries is what we're looking at today. Let's dig into Stanley and his monster number one to four. got four comics to look at, so not really going to deep dive look at all the covers. Only to say, they're all good, especially love the first issues where presumably Phil Folio is pitching this very book to his editor, but the editor wants to turn it into a grim and gritty 90s comic. Even by 1993, some people were beginning to get sick of that crap. Also, the second issue's cover, where Nyx is introduced, and the art is intended to make her look sexy, to the confusion of Stanley and the horror of the monsters around her. Well, now that you know this character exists, Internet, I expect porn of her on my desk by 9 a.m. sharp, or we know the world really has gone to hell. The thing to understand walking into this book is that while it's a humor book, it's technically in continuity to DC. And in continuity to Vertigo, whose relationship with DC was a bit closer to canon at the time, in particular Neil Gaiman's Sandman series. As such, we open in hell. Hell, the most awful place you can imagine. I see a YouTube comment section with everyone asking when the next history of Power Rangers is. But the next series isn't even over yet. Currently under new management. Now guaranteed to be even worse. Yeah, I hear they're ending Hell's dental plan, and that's kind of important to have when a lot of demons have fangs that hang outside of their mouths. Yeah, long story short, Lucifer ain't in charge of Hell during this time, and God assigned some angels to keep the place running. 
They've just finished gathering all the demons back into hell, but they notice that there's still one missing, referred to as the Nameless One. A demon informs them that it's on Earth. No, this will not do at all. Etrigan is bad enough, but there is no excuse for two of them running around loose. We must deal with this at once, Duma. Ah, the Nameless One shouldn't worry. They're gonna form a planning committee to decide what to do about it, but they'll be bogged down for a few hundred years on figuring out procedure first. The demons in the crowd laugh about this since the Nameless One is on Earth because Lucifer exiled him. He was apparently contaminated by good. Damn! I'd say we have a pill for that now, but as the new managers, we canceled the healthcare plan too! Actually, they're not telling the angels about that detail, wanting them to make a mistake. With the prologue out of the way, we cut to Earth. Earth, the most awful place you can imagine, if you live in Los Angeles. Other than that, it's pretty neat. I can think of a worse place to live. Marvel. Anyway, dispensing with any kind of origin or the like, I guess it just assumes you know what the deal is with this series already. And here we see Stanley playing with the monster in his attic. They found a bunch of stuff from the 70s, like a tricorner hat from the USA's Bicentennial, and a John Travolta Saturday Night Fever outfit for the monster. He fits in that thing shockingly well. Anyway, the real treasure they discover is a book. The Heterodyne Boy's Big Book of Fun. Oh gee whiz, think of how many frequencies we can combine! Despite the name, it's actually a general purpose how-to book for building stuff. How to build a fish trap, how to build a zeppelin, how to- Oh! Oh wow! How to build a neutron bomb using only Lysol, baking soda, and Chex Mix! The title of this- Oh Jesus! Stanley's gonna eat my soul! <laughs> Are you sure Stanley isn't the exiled demon? Criminy. Okay, Stanley decides to build a tree fort with instructions from the book, though the monster thinks his mother won't allow it. So who will tell her? It's a good thing mom never actually looks at the backyard. Stanley is called down to dinner and the monster, okay, he calls him Spot, so we'll go with that name, says he'll keep out of sight. Your parents still think me imaginary, and I'd hate to shatter an illusion like that before dinner. Yeah, disillusionment goes best with hot fudge sundaes. Take this book back to my room, and don't eat it! Stanley, you wound me! I already have this delicious stack of National Geographics, thank you! Eh, the summer issues are always so under-seasoned. At dinner, Stanley asks about the Heterodyne Boys, which was essentially just a series of adventure books. Basically just a renamed Hardy Boys, though again, I wonder about the choice to name it Heterodyne. Anyway, Stanley's father mentions that he used to read them as a kid, but the most coveted of the books was a how-to book. For some reason, Stanley gets freaked out by him acknowledging that book's existence and deliberately spills his milk to derail the conversation. That night, Stanley dreams of being a superhero who fights the Joker, who has another clever variation on the fake gun that goes bang. In this case, it's an actual bullet attached to the end of the flag, but still goes fast enough to pop the cap off this goon's head. It's not that gory because this goon isn't actually a real person. He's really a giant novelty water bottle. The next morning, Stanley and Spot discuss the one location that would work best for the tree fort, a particular tree that belongs to an old guy who doesn't like people climbing it. Still, he figures he might be able to trick him by asking to become the caretaker of it, and that he'd need an office in said tree as the caretaker. The guy sees through it, but recognizes the book. He recalls to Stanley how he had the book as a kid and wanted to use plans to build a zeppelin, no doubt in his long-term plan to become a supervillain, but his mother thought the scheme was too dangerous and burned the book! More than a little excessive parenting, though apparently it royally pissed off his dad and he didn't speak to her for three weeks. Still, the nostalgia, plus the agreement to let him study the Zeppelin plans out of the book, encourages him to agree to Stanley's proposal, instructing him not to tell his mom about it. He and Spot go to work, Stanley wanting to make the tree fort extra big, fantasizing about all the kids who would want in on it. Until Superman shows up and tells the kids to stop fighting over it and go home. So that he and the Justice League can use it as their new base! Superman! Stealing kids' tree forts! Apparently that is an unappealing idea for him, so he decides to go small. He gets wood from a repairman, once again showing off the book to a guy who recognizes it. He manages to get a massive pile of wood from him, though the guy is confused how he got it all out of there so quickly. Stanley says the instructions for how to build a forklift are in the book too. This is the song written for the comic. Stanley Dover, 
built this one too. He tried to lie about a forklift. Sorry, sorry, I had to modify that ending there. Since Stanley wouldn't kill anyone with a forklift, he's got spot for that. Speaking of, yeah, he just had Spot lift all the wood, who's annoyed about him lying about the forklift. I just told him that the plans to build one are on page 78. Ugh, you're definitely a bad influence on me, Stanley. At trial, Spot blamed his killing spree on the influence of Stanley. After construction begins, Stanley has another dream, this time where he saves his parents from disaster by leading them to the treehouse. What disaster? The invasion of the space dinosaurs versus the Armageddon War of the Gods Crises crossover! Ugh, event comics have gotten so samey nowadays. Also, one of the dinosaurs is in Starfleet. So that's what happened to the dinosaurs from the book and record set. So here's a weird bit for the Vertigo parody. The dream ends with the Sandman showing up to tell him that the dream is over because they've exceeded their special effects budget. Except it's the Golden Age Sandman and not Dream of the Endless. He's got the white on black speech balloons though, so wonder if it was just a case of Gaiman or his editor saying no to him appearing. Anyway, Tree Fort is done and Stanley wants to test it out by sleeping in it that night, though needs to sneak all the pillows and blankets and stuff out to it without his parents being suspicious. He does this by wearing said objects while loudly announcing various superheroes he's pretending to be. Mind you, they only get suspicious when he states that he's going to bed early. Obviously something a small child would never do. We get a heartwarming scene in the treehouse where Spot tells a story of life in hell, though making sure to censor himself so that he doesn't tell really inappropriate tales to a little kid. Hell sounds like a very silly place. Don't you miss it? No, not even a little, Stanley. You see, we'd play tricks on each other all the time, but nobody was your friend. Not really. Nobody was anybody's friend. I'm your friend. I'm yours, Stanley. Why wasn't this concept adapted into a family-friendly sitcom in the 90s? A storm starts up and Spot can sense something wrong, especially when someone seems to be climbing up the tree fort. Fortunately, it just turns out to be Stanley's mom. She's impressed by his craftsmanship, even revealing that the how-to book was hers from when she was a little girl. And she's a little mad for lying, but that they can talk about it later since a lightning storm is starting up and she doesn't want him to be in a tree during it. Ah, he should be fine. I mean, it's not like he's with two other kids arguing over a radioactive man issue. Spot stays behind, pretending to be pillows, though wonders why he suddenly got so on edge. And the answer to that soon reveals herself in the form of rhyming. Nyx, who we learn is an ex-girlfriend of his. Like with issue one, we begin with a prologue where a guy who is decidedly not John Constantine is informed of a couple of demons that are on Earth that he has to go deal with. But yeah, he is not John Constantine. He even says so. His name is Ambrose Pierce. Aw, oh, dude, why'd you shave off the awesome mustache? Back over to Nixon's spot, she informs him about the change in management in Hell and their request to bring him back. Also, we've got to talk about Nix's outfit. Because when we see it from behind, we see no evidence that that sexy bathing suit or whatever she's wearing has any backside to it whatsoever, despite it going between her legs. It does not go back up around her legs. I'm 90% certain that thing is literally wedged up her butt. Anyway, Spot refuses to return, and she's quite happy about that since it gives her a chance to claw at him. She's pissed that he's become a good person and enjoyed him when he was evil. I wasn't good enough in any sense of the word. All you gave was pain! And love. I mean, you can't change someone's preferences, Nyx, but I can assure you there are plenty of guys out there who'd appreciate the pain and love. Especially the pain. This is a lot of innuendo for a book that last issue was about tree forts. Spot actually apologizes to her because he apparently expected her to turn good when he did, and he was wrong to make such an expectation. She's just annoyed that he's apologizing at all and starts tearing into him. You make me feel like I'm something broken! You make me feel like I'm doing something wrong! I'd say these two need couples counseling, but I'm pretty sure it's just she's not taking the breakup well. She plans to kill him and tell the angels that he fought back and was forced to do this, but fortunately, especially in a story featuring hells and demons, an act of God saves the day as lightning strikes the tree fort and sends both him and Nyx flying away. Nyx is knocked out, so Spot makes a run for it back to the house. Back at the house, Stanley says he's worried about his dog, the two believe Spot to be an imaginary friend of his, and Stanley says that his mom saw Spot. She says she saw nothing, but then has a minor moment of revelation. Just some big, red, shaggy 
pillows. Wait a second. Stanley, did you steal pillows from mommy and daddy's private room downstairs? There's a knock at the door and it's Bierce, claiming to be a guy whose car broke down who wants to use their phone. After the call, which of course he fakes, he claims it'll take about three hours to get help for it due to the storm. Stanley's mom invites him to stick around, even pointing out the literary connection with his name since she's a librarian. When Bierce mentions that he used to be a magician, Stanley name drops some DC magic characters, including John Constantine, claiming that a friend told him about the guy. Wondering if Stanley is the demon he's looking for, he gives him a trick water pistol and tells him to shoot it at him. But the trick is that it shoots holy water back in Stanley's face. Well, that'll teach you to do whatever anybody tells you to do. Question authority, Stanley, dear. Someday you shall even rebel against my power as your mother. Though you will fail. Spot, worried over Stanley and his family, realizes that he needs to let Nyx take him back to hell lest she harm the kid. So he heads over to say goodbye to him. However, when he spots Beers, he senses the magic from him and assumes it's Nyx in disguise. He confronts him privately. All right, you win! Don't hurt anybody! I'm at your mercy! Having trouble with our pronouns, are we? What do you mean? I'm deeply terrified of you! I am ready to submit to your demands and come along peacefully! Ah! Nyx tracks Spot back to the house and, as it turns out, was given strict instructions to not harm mortals or cause destruction. So she decides to sneak in another way. Unfortunately, she's a little out of date since she disguises herself as like a pilgrim era woman or something. When that doesn't work, she instead transforms into Stanley's mom and changes her into the pilgrim garb, trying to trick Stanley and his father. But she's still speaking in the old timey voice. Draw some water from the well. We must call for a priest or a leech. First, of course, we must drive all demons from the immediate vicinity. Where are they hiding? Oh, Nix, you give yourself away so easily. <laughs> After all, if they knew where the demons were hiding, why wouldn't they already be dealing with them? Of course, the two are just confused as all hell. That does it! I cannot understand why everybody speaks so well of subtlety. It never works. I don't know why I even try anymore. Nyx was an apprentice of Garth Marenghi. She transforms back, causing Stanley's dad to faint. Spot and Bierce overhear this and come running to help. She gets hold of the holy water pistol and accidentally shoots herself with it. Combined with an attack by Spot, she's knocked out and they discuss what to do now. They come up with a plan, tricking Nyx into thinking they've transformed Spot into a stuffed animal and that they planned to do the same to her. After a struggle, they agree to just let her take the stuffed animal back to hell. However, once there, the angels quickly identify that it's just a real stuffed animal with an illusion spell cast on it. Pissed, they say she needs a lesson in accountability while they take a more direct approach. Back at the house, Beers gives Spot a talisman that should prevent him from being found by hell again, but the issue ends with Stanley's parents seeing Spot in the flesh. So, uh, does that mean you don't actually need the talisman at all then? Because it was kind of expensive. Beers thinks quickly and says Spot's an Indian tribal spirit, that this place used to be a Native American village, and Spot a protective spirit dog, whom Stanley had awoken a few months ago by accident. He's now become Stanley's protector and helped fight off the demon they saw earlier. I don't know, it feels like that explanation is kind of racist, playing into stereotypes and all. It's just since this is something that Bierce is making up, I don't know if that counts as it just the characters believing something like that versus actually advancing said ideas. Not helped by the fact that this is the DC universe where all spirits and ghosts and gods are completely and totally real. Screw it, this is a comic about a kid who has a pet demon. Let's move on. Anyway, Stanley points out that his parents already agreed to let him keep him when they thought it was his imaginary friend, and that he stayed out of trouble so far. They agree to let him stay as long as there isn't any problem. As Bierce leaves, though, he's soon confronted by another demonic creature who can now locate him because he doesn't have the amulet anymore. As such, he's forced to sneak into the house to get the amulet back. He mixes a bit of magic and tech by wiring the amulet into an electrical outlet so its protection extends to the entire house. He needs to build a new amulet since he doesn't want to be a jerk and take back the one he gave away, so he stays in the attic to order the supplies he needs for it in the meantime. Shenanigans ensue, first from Stanley trying to make his mom feel more comfortable about Spot by having him do chores and only ending up freaking her out, and then by deliveries being made to the house thanks to Bierce ordering supplies and Spot trying to protect 
pretend like he ordered them. Like, for instance, the Pytorian Pyramidal Forge. He claims it's a hat, and then he puts it on. And when he puts it on, it zaps him but good. Oh hey, same thing happened when I first put this thing on. Fortunately, there were no side kerplunkses at all. Isn't that right, Astro Mega Ship? You're usually more talkative than this. We also get a nice heart-to-heart -heart talk between Stanley's mom and Spot, where she wonders about why the bizarre and supernatural parts of the DC Universe continue to weird her out despite it being a near constant of it all. Spot pointing out that humans have their own form of selective amnesia to try to cope with the harsher parts of life. Maybe you can't deal with the fact that there are powers and beings that could destroy humanity before breakfast. Maybe too much knowledge of the fantastic makes humans incapable of dealing with the mundane on a day-to-day -day basis. Or maybe you just like being surprised. Surprise! Your free will has just been supplanted by Darkseid and the anti-life equation! When one of the books ordered turns out to be a dangerous grimoire, they tell her about beer so she doesn't assume that Spot is the one looking into evil magic stuff. She tries to force him out, but he just casts a spell to make her go away for a while. While she and Stanley's father return, in their rage, they destroy the amulet, which allows the angels to instantly find Spot and bring him back to hell. Stanley wants to follow him to hell to get him back, but Beers doesn't think it's possible. But someone else arrives to say it can be done. The Phantom Stranger, ending issue 3. The Phantom Stranger is indeed here to help, but there's a complication. So who are you? I... am a stranger. Oh, too bad. Too bad. I said I am here to help you. Maybe, but Mom says that I'm not allowed to talk to strangers. She's right. You don't know who this guy is. I mean, he could be a fallen angel, or a being caught in a time loop, or Judas Iscariot. It's just dangerous, kids. Stanley says he'll talk to him if his parents say it's okay, but the stranger gets impatient and uses a spell to make them just stand with smiles on their faces. Naturally, that's not good enough for Stanley. As such, Bierce just volunteers to take the kid to hell himself if the stranger just provides the tools. He reluctantly agrees, Stanley quickly acquiring all the things he thinks he'll need for this jaunt into hell. Soda, a package of hot dogs, an umbrella, a bottle of barbecue sauce, and a Halloween mask. This kid is doomed. I mean, where is his towel? Using the Seal of Kloon, the two and their supplies are dragged to hell through a portal. First, they travel through various alternate dimensions, including one repeating old sitcom lines. Ah, the WandaVision dimension. I suspect that this particular realm is where old TV shows go to die. Look, there's Cop Rock! And Heil Honey, I'm Home! And... Oh my god. It's Turn On! The two arrive at the gates of hell. Unfortunately, for some reason, Bierce can't go any further. Stanley, listen, this is important. Hell is exactly like you think it is. It's watching a really bad 70s variety show over and over and over again for all eternity. Actually, what he means is that Hell's power over you is more psychological than anything else. Thus, it's only as monstrous and horrifying as you imagine it to be. And with that understanding, Stanley walks in and the area transforms into a brighter, more cartoony environment. In fact, when some demons try to confront him, he uses the Halloween mask he brought as a disguise. And because he thinks it will work to make him appear like another demon, it does, even if the demons know his reality. The demon directs him to where he's supposed to sign in, and fortunately, Spot was assigned desk duty at sign in, so the two are reunited. Spot's boss, Glifford, tries to stop them, but Stanley makes a deal, offering him hot dogs, since everybody likes hot dogs, and he takes the hot dog and walks off a cliff. How did you make him do that? Hey, demons are stupid. It's the kind of logic that only works with the brazen confidence and innocence of a child. I believe demons are cartoony and stupid, therefore they are, and I am invincible. Although, when they walk out, the gate to hell has moved farther away. Spotting the tools that Stanley brought with that he thought he'd need to escape hell, Spot realizes that this was Bierce's way of helping. Stanley is caught in a causality loop. Not a time loop like one would assume with that name, but rather a form of predestination paradox. These items that Stanley chose must be used before they can escape, because they are the items that he's chosen that will be helpful. Therefore, they must be used before they can escape, because they're the items that he chose to- Oh no, I've gone cross-eyed.
Anywho, Clifford is back, having summoned two giant demonic beings made of fire to get them to turn around. However, Stanley says that their impressive special effects, arguing with Clifford as to their reality to the point where Clifford's anger somehow summons a rainstorm. Thus, the umbrella that Stanley brought is used and the flames of the fire giants are put out. Also, this is probably the first rainstorm Hell has had in thousands of years, so good job at ending the drought, Stanley. As they walk off, Stanley asks Spot why he didn't just tell the angels about their mistake. Angels don't make mistakes, Stanley. Really? Because, uh, you might want to remember where it is you're walking through, dude. Glifford tries to intervene himself by going giant-sized, but Stanley dispatches him using the wagon he's been carrying everything in to slip on and fall off a cliff. As they get closer to the gate, they come across a punishment node, a device used to torment demons who step out of line. Realizing who must have pissed off the angels for one to be made so quickly, Spot frees its occupant, Nyx, who thinks she's just hallucinating this rescue. Here, give her a cold soda. And it's Joke Cola, with more sap. <laughs> Totally a ripoff of Cuba Cola Natural, made with 100% real maple syrup. And indeed, this Sprite commercial rejuvenates her, though she still wants to attack Spot. However, Stanley's overall alterations to Hell have affected her, too, so she just kisses him instead of tearing him apart, to her annoyance. The two talk privately about their issues. Nick's feeling betrayed by being left behind, but Spot points out that, well... She stayed evil. He can't allow himself to be hurt by her. Wait, teach me. What? Teach me how to be good. Man, the original concept for the good place was weird. He agrees and they're off again, confronted by Glifford one last time. He's gotten Cerberus to help stop them and, well, three-headed dog probably won't be stopped by an umbrella. Still, Stanley gets ready to deal with them, but this time Glifford's come prepared as creatures emerge from the ground. Giant worms! Who shall we have worm sign the likes of which even God has never seen? Well, the hyperbole is actually kind of accurate. Nyx is not captured by the worms, since Glifford doesn't realize she's changed sides. As such, she dumps the remaining item that Stanley brought, barbecue sauce, onto Glifford, which gets Cerberus' attention and chases him off. However, as they finally exit Hell, Stanley's effects on Hell cease, including on Nyx, who's pissed about this whole thing. She's even in tears as she demands Spot not say that he loves her. But the angels finally arrive to put an end to all this. Stanley and Spot finally tell them about how Spot was exiled for being good. As restitution for their screw-ups, Stanley asks them to square things away with his parents over all this. Spot just asks that Nyx be forgiven for all this, and the angels are even happier to do that. Hell's purpose is to allow souls to purify themselves by whatever means they deem necessary. And nothing purifies a soul faster than daily acid baths and getting flayed constantly. Demonkind has been resisting their efforts at reform or positive change, but Spot is proof that it is possible. And in fact, through Nyx being exposed to his goodness, it might have done her a world of good, whether she realizes it or not. Our heroes are returned home, where Stanley's parents were evidently already talked to by the angels. Stanley's father is a little reluctant to let Spot stay, since this whole thing is kind of weird, and so our comic ends with Stanley's mom pointing out that the DC Universe is full of aliens, supernatural beings, monsters, and who knows what else. So this is normal. This comic is great. I actually ended up skimming over a lot of jokes and material because I'd otherwise just be repeating them. I wouldn't exactly call it laugh-out-loud funny, but it is light-hearted and fun, with a few adult insider jokes. Otherwise, it's keeping things fairly PG for a comic where characters literally go to hell. The artwork at times can be a bit simple or rushed, but it definitely carries the overall fun and cartoony mood of the whole thing. It's just a fun series, and I'd honestly be down for them doing a revival of the concept for kids, either for TV or an all-ages book. You can make it work both as an older Stanley doing crime-fighting kind of thing, with Spot, or just a young Stanley innocently dealing with the weird supernatural stuff while never getting too serious. It's just a good idea for a series. Now, DC did later take the idea in a darker, slightly more traumatizing direction, but I don't actually have any real complaints about it. After Green Arrow was returned to life in 2001, comic books, 
His opening storyline by Kevin Smith revealed the deeper origins of why the monster hooked up with Stanley. His grandfather, also named Stanley in an attempt at a cliffhanger misdirection, was a Satanist who attempted to gain power by imprisoning a demon. He even briefly encountered Dream of the Endless during his time trapped in a dude's cellar. His daughter, Stanley's mother, asked him to take care of baby Stanley, and he held on to the kid during a ritual accidentally attaching the beast with no name to the baby Stanley. Once he discovered what had happened, he imprisoned Stanley to try to get Spot to reappear. Fortunately, with the help of Green Arrow, Stanley got freed and Spot erased his memory of the traumatic experience to spare him some pain. Before then eating Grandpa Stan, because screw that guy. He was evil and happily talking about all the evil things he was going to do. Stanley and his monster have made a brief cameo here and there afterwards, but otherwise no new series since then, which is a bit of a shame. Next time, though, time to really dive into some history. I've been teasing you guys with this since last year, so let's finally really get into it. Marvel Then Meets the Eye, my three-part retrospective on Marvel's Transformers comics. How can we get past him? I don't know. Well, I suppose I could- Forget it! He's been neutered! Wait, were they suggesting Nyx was gonna have sex with the dog? Hello my friends, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!